As a primary care physician, emergency physician, nurse practitioner, or allied health professional, it is important that you be able to perform an appropriate ocular examination. This exam is essential not only to screen for primary ocular disease, but for detecting ocular signs and symptoms of systemic disease as well. This video has been designed specifically for the non-ophthalmologist. Your guide is Dr. Mansour Movagar of Dean Medical Center in Madison, Wisconsin. It's our goal to give you the basic framework for the ocular examination of an adult or child. After practicing the techniques, you should be able to take a basic ocular history, perform the basic ocular examination, recognize the signs and symptoms of eye pathology, and know when to refer patients to an ophthalmologist. We will begin with a quick review of basic eye anatomy. The white of the eye is the sclera, which is covered by conjunctiva, a thin membranous structure. The colored portion of the eye is the iris. The central dark area is the pupil, which is the aperture of the iris and allows light to enter the eye. The clear covering of the iris and pupil is the cornea. The cornea has many pain fibers and is extremely sensitive to even minor injury. The eyelids offer protection to the eye. The lower eyelid is normally positioned at the limbus, the site where the sclera and cornea merge, while the upper lid is typically a millimeter below the upper limbus. Let's look at the eye in cross-section now. The space between the cornea and iris is the anterior chamber, which is filled with aqueous humor, the clear fluid which circulates throughout the front of the eye. The crystalline lens is behind the iris and helps to focus the light onto the retina. Moving posteriorly, there is the vitreous cavity, which is filled with a gel-like material, the vitreous. The retina lines the inner surface of the posterior portion of the eye. Here is the optic nerve. The globe is encased in a bony structure called the orbit. Six extraocular muscles attach to the globe and one to the upper lid. We will begin with taking the patient's history. The purpose of the history is to determine the patient's chief complaint and to obtain information on any present illness or past ocular history that may help in evaluating, diagnosing, or treating the patient's condition. Details of the patient's medical history and family history may also prove useful. I'm having problems with my right eye. Have the I patient describe his or her chief complaint and record it in the patient's own words. This description should include information regarding location, onset, duration, progression, severity, and treatment. Asking these specific questions can be helpful. Are you having any vision or eye problems? Have both near and far vision been affected? When did the problem start? Did it start suddenly or gradually? Are the symptoms constant or intermittent and frequent or infrequent? Does a specific activity trigger the symptoms or make them worse? Has the problem become better or worse over time? Do the symptoms interfere with your work or other activities? Have you ever been treated for this complaint, and if so, when, how, and by whom? The patient's past ocular history is important. This should include information regarding the use of any corrective lenses, either glasses or contacts, eye surgery, including laser procedures, cataract, glaucoma, corneal, retinal, eyelid, eye muscle surgery, or refractive laser procedures, ocular trauma, recurrent eye infections, strabismus, which is misalignment of the eyes, glaucoma, retinal disease, or other significant eye problems. General medical problems which affect the eyes include diabetes mellitus, heart disease, hypertension, thyroid disease, and inflammatory diseases such as sarcoidosis. A history of allergies to medications and other allergens should be recorded. Be sure to obtain a list of the patient's medications, both ocular and systemic. You should note the name of the medication, along with both how often the patient is supposed to take it and the frequency of actual use. If the patient is using eye medications, record which eye is being treated. Regarding family history, ask the patient if any family members have had similar ocular or medical problems.
To measure visual acuity, you can use either a 20-foot hallway area or a 10-foot exam room. Use a visual acuity chart, such as the Snell and I chart, designed for either 10 or 20 feet, to match your examination area. For pre-literate children, you should have a picture chart or a tumbling e-chart. You will also need a near vision card, a pen light with a blue filter, a direct ophthalmoscope, dilating drops, anesthetic drops, fluorescein strips, and cotton tip applicators. Now we will illustrate how to assess the patient's vision. Specifically, we will demonstrate how to check central visual acuity both at distance and near and how to check the peripheral visual field. We will describe the procedure for testing adults. Later in the video, we will cover techniques for the pediatric exam. The familiar Snellen distance visual acuity chart displays lines of block letters of diminishing size, each defined according to the distance at which the lines of letters can be read by a person with normal acuity. For example, the top number represents the distance in feet at which the test was performed, and the bottom number corresponds to the distance at which the letters could be seen by a person with normal visual acuity. For example, if the smallest letters a patient can read correctly are on the 2100 line, the patient is able to read at 20 feet what the normal eye can read at 100 feet, and the visual acuity is recorded as 2100. If the patient can read the letters on the 2020 line at 20 feet, that means the patient's visual acuity is equivalent to that of a normal eye. Some patients are able to read even smaller letters at 20 feet. In such a case, their visual acuity might be recorded as 2015 or even 2010. To assess a patient's central visual acuity, position the patient at the designated distance from a well-illuminated Snellen chart. Be sure to use a chart design for your testing distance. The patient should wear the customary eyeglasses or contacts used for distance viewing. Test each eye separately, being careful to completely occlude the eye not being tested, but without compressing the eye. This can be accomplished by having the patient cover the eye with the palm of his hand, not the fingers, or by inserting a tissue behind the patient's glasses. For each eye, record the smallest line of print the patient can read. If 50% or more letters on a line are identified correctly, give the patient credit for that line. Here's how to properly record the results of the visual acuity test. Write V for visual acuity with a subscript D for distance or N for near. It's customary to record the right eye result on top and the left eye on the bottom. Specify if the vision was checked with glasses, contact lenses, or without correction. If a patient cannot see the largest Snellen letters, then check if he or she can count the number of fingers on your hand. Hold up one, two, or five fingers, beginning approximately five feet away. If the patient cannot identify the number of fingers, move closer and repeat the test. The visual acuity is recorded as the farthest distance the patient can correctly identify the number of fingers shown. If the patient cannot see your fingers even when they're held very near the face, try moving the whole hand either side to side or up and down. If the patient correctly identifies the direction of motion, the vision is recorded as hand motions. If the patient cannot see hand movements, a handheld light, such as a pen light, is directed at the eye. The opposite eye must be completely covered so that no light is visible to it. Ask if the patient can tell when the light is on and from which direction it's being projected. If the patient can correctly identify the direction of the light, Record it as light perception with projection. If the light is seen but not its direction, record it as light perception without projection. If the light is not seen, the vision is recorded as NLP or no light perception and means the eye is completely blind. Near vision should be tested next. Patients should wear their glasses if they normally require them for reading. If the patient requires a bifocal for reading, they should use it for this test. Hold the near vision card at their usual reading distance, typically about 14 inches. If you do not have a near card, use a magazine or newspaper and note the smallest type the patient can read. Remember, 
The central visual acuity is the most important aspect of the exam. Peripheral visual field testing is also important. Confrontation visual field testing is a gross means of assessing defects in the peripheral vision, which can be caused by retinal, optic nerve, or central nervous system abnormalities. To begin, align yourself directly in front of the patient so that you're face to face and about three feet apart. Explain that you will hold up some fingers and that the patient should tell you how many they see while looking at your eye and not at your hands. Have the patient cover his left eye with his hand so that he cannot look through his fingers but be sure he's not pressing on his eye. Close your right eye and ask the patient to look continuously at your open left eye. Hold your hands equidistant between you and the patient about 18 inches from the patient within the limit of your own peripheral field. Test each of the four quadrants. Ask the patient to tell you how many fingers they see. Assuming your own visual field is normal, the patient should be able to see the same thing you do. Use one, two, or five fingers as these tend to be less confusing. Hold up the fingers briefly, then close your hand. The patient must maintain fixation on your eye while testing in order to assess the peripheral field. Test the left eye in a similar manner, but having the patient look at your open right eye. If the patient's confrontation visual field is grossly normal, make an appropriate notation in the chart. Visual field abnormalities are noted by drawing the field from the patient's perspective as shown. Here's an example of a right superior visual field defect in both eyes. If a defect is detected, the patient should be referred for formal visual field testing. In this section, we will discuss the external eye exam, including how to avert eyelids and the technique for installation of fluorescein to look for corneal abrasions. The external exam can identify a broad range of pathology. First, look at the patient's face for any asymmetry of the facial bones and the location of the globes. Look for vertical or horizontal displacement of the eyeball itself, as well as a sunken, enophthalmic or protruding exophthalmic eye. Look at the eyelid position in both eyes. Any asymmetry or ptosis, drooping of the eyelid, should be noted. Ptosis in older adults is most often due to aging changes, but can be the result of more serious pathology and should be referred for immediate evaluation if of recent onset and associated with other findings such as diplopia and a dilated pupil. Other common eyelid abnormalities frequently encountered include entropion and ectropion, anchalasia and hordeola. In children, ptosis can represent a serious problem. Unilateral ptosis should be referred immediately to the ophthalmologist. The presence of bilateral ptosis, which is presumably congenital, should be referred in early infancy. Also look for any eyelid masses, periorbital erythema, lash loss, or eyelid inflammation. Look at the patient's conjunctiva and sclera. Conjunctivitis and conjunctival foreign bodies are fairly common problems. In conjunctivitis, document the conjunctival inflammation on a scale of plus 1 to plus 4. Describe any discharge or tearing. Describe the color and character of the discharge. If a foreign body is suspected, pull the lower lid down while the patient looks up to see the inferior fornix as debris can become lodged there. To look for foreign bodies that can become lodged under the upper lid, you may need to avert the upper eyelid. Instill a drop of topical anesthetic before averting the upper eyelid. Ask the patient to look down and keep looking down throughout the maneuver. Hold a cotton swab with the stick end positioned about halfway up from the eyelid margin against the eyelid. With gentle elevation of the lashes and slight downward pressure on the cotton swab, the upper eyelid will avert to reveal the inner conjunctival surface. A foreign body, if seen, may be removed with a wet cotton tip applicator or the end of a 25 gauge needle. The patient's natural tendencies will be to squeeze the eyes shut and pull away. Explain what you're going to do beforehand to reduce the patient's anxiety. 
Similar techniques may be used to remove corneal foreign bodies, but greater care must be taken to avoid damage to the corneal surface, which could result in a permanent scar in the visual axis. The cornea should be clear, allowing good visualization of the iris detail. If it's hazy, this could indicate increased intraocular pressure. If there is a corneal opacity, it could indicate an infection or a scar, as seen here. Corneal abrasions are fairly common and can be detected by staining the cornea with fluorescent dye illuminated by a cobalt blue light. To place fluorescein dye in an eye, take a sterile fluorescein impregnated paper strip and dampen the end with a single drop of topical anesthetic. Carefully blot the excess dye and avoid getting it on any clothing as it can leave a permanent stain. Ask the patient to look up and pull the lower eyelid down to expose the conjunctiva. Dab the wet fluorescein strip against the inner surface of the eyelid and then ask the patient to blink. Now illuminate the eye with a cobalt blue light, a pen light with a blue filter. An abrasion will show up as a greenish yellow stain on the cornea. The anterior chamber should be clear and have depth, that is, the iris detail should be clearly visible and should not be in opposition to the posterior side of the cornea. Shine a pen light across the cornea. The light should uniformly illuminate the iris. Pus in the anterior chamber, a hypopion, or blood in the anterior chamber, a hyphema, warrant immediate referral. We will now turn to the pupillary examination. When examining the pupils, you will want a dimly lit exam room. Since normal pupils react equally, a light shining into one eye will have the same effect on the other eye, so both eyes are observed first simultaneously and then separately during the pupil exam. Ask the patient to look at a target across the room. Shine a pen light up at the eyes from just below the patient's nose. The pupils should be round and equal in size. Assess the reaction to direct light in each eye separately by shining the light into the right eye. The pupil should constrict briskly when the light is directed into the eye. The light is then directed away from the eyes to allow the pupils to dilate. Then assess the left pupil in the same manner. Next, the light is moved swiftly back and forth between the eyes. This is the so-called swinging flashlight test. Normally, there will be little or no pupil movement. If an afferent pupillary defect, or APD, is present, the pupil will dilate when light is directed into the affected eye. The pupil in the normal eye will constrict when light is directed into it. This patient has a right-sided APD. When the normal left eye is stimulated, both pupils constrict briskly. When the affected right eye is stimulated, there is no pupillary constriction, just dilation. When performing the swinging flashlight test, as the light moves from the left eye to the right eye, both pupils dilate rather than remaining constricted. If an APD is present, the pupil on the affected side will dilate when light is projected into it. A normal physiologic pupillary response that is easy to misinterpret as abnormal is hippus. This is a slightly rhythmic movement of the pupil. When shining a light on the pupil, you should initially see the pupil constrict. If you watch the pupil, you will note that it does not necessarily stay constricted, but enlarges slightly, then reconstricts. The pupil may even appear to bounce slightly between dilation and constriction. Hippus is usually symmetric and is not a pathologic finding. Hippus can make it difficult at times to recognize an afferent pupillary defect but the key is to look for the initial movement of the pupil. In an afferent pupillary defect, the pupil initially dilates and continues to dilate. In hippus, there is an initial constriction of the pupil followed by slight dilation, and it is symmetric in both eyes. The ocular motility exam is performed to look for strabismus, which is a relative misalignment of the eyes. This part of the exam also tests cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. First, evaluate the extraocular movements. Sit face to face with the patient. Ask her to follow a pen, toy, or one finger with the eyes only, holding the head still. Hold the target about one foot from the patient's face. 
move the target through the nine positions of gaze, straight ahead, up and right, straight up, up and left, straight left, down and left, straight down, down and right, and finally straight right. When the patient is looking down, it's helpful to hold up the eyelids to see the eye movement. Note if both eyes move to the full extent at each position. As a quick screening method for strabismus, especially with patients who have poor vision in one eye or those with limited cooperation, you can use the position of the corneal light reflex. Using a fixation target and a pen light or other small bright light source, hold the light next to the target asking the patient to look at the target and observe where the corneal light reflex falls in each eye in relationship to the pupil. Normally, the light reflex should be located centrally or slightly nasal within the pupil and symmetrically in both eyes. If the patient has an esotropia or eyes turning in, the light reflex will be displaced temporarily in the deviating eye. If the patient has an exotropia or eyes turning out, the light reflex will be displaced nasally in the deviating eye. Cover testing is a more precise and accurate way to look for strabismus. With the patient wearing their distance glasses, ask them to look at a distant fixation target. It's important that the patient is fixating on a target in order to test accurately. If the patient is looking around the room, your findings will be meaningless. First, cover one eye and watch the uncovered eye for any movement. Next, uncover the eye, pausing slightly to allow the patient to look at the target with both eyes. Next, cover the other eye. This is the cover-uncover test. This test will detect an esotropia, eyes turned in, exotropia, eyes turned out, and vertical deviations. Normally, there will be no movement of either eye when you perform the cover test. If a patient has an esotropia and you cover the fixating eye, the crossed eye will turn out to see the object. If the patient has an exotropia and you cover the fixating eye, then the deviating eye will turn in to see the object. When covering the fixating eye in a patient with a vertical deviation, the deviating eye will move up or down to see the object. If there is a deviation, note if it is an esotropia, exotropia, or vertical deviation. Any child with strabismus or suspected strabismus should be referred to an ophthalmologist. In addition, adults with newly acquired strabismus or double vision should be referred for evaluation. The direct ophthalmoscope is used to assess the red reflex of the patient's fundus and to view the retina and optic nerve. This evaluation is best performed with the patient's pupil pharmacologically dilated. Although ophthalmoscopy is enhanced by dilation, it is possible to perform it without dilation. Two commonly used dilating agents are tropicamide, available in 0.5% or 1% concentration and phenylephrine, available in a 2.5% concentration. Tropicamide is an anticholinergic agent, and phenylephrine is an adrenergic agent. Tropicamide takes approximately 20 to 40 minutes to take effect and lasts 3 to 6 hours. Rare side effects include flushing, fever, tachycardia, and stinging. Phenylephrine also takes 20 to 40 minutes to take effect and lasts approximately 2 hours. The possible side effects include increased blood pressure and tachycardia. Avoid using phenylephrine in patients with poorly controlled hypertension. Patients with narrow angles may be at risk for an acute angle closure glaucoma attack after pupillary dilation. This is fairly rare, and if a patient has been seen by an ophthalmologist who notes narrow angles, the patient should have been informed. If narrow angles are present, ophthalmoscopy should be performed without dilation. To instill eye drops, the patient should tilt their head back and look upward, keeping both eyes open. Pull down on the patient's lower eyelid to create a pocket between the eyeball and the inside of the lower eyelid. Place a single drop in this pocket. 
Ask the patient to close their eyes for a minute without blinking and to apply pressure to the medial canthus to prevent drainage through the nasolacrimal system. The tip of the bottle should never come in contact with the patient's eye, eyelids, or lashes. If it does, the bottle is contaminated and could transmit infections. The bottle should be discarded. Dim the room lights to enhance pupillary dilation. Ophthalmoscopy can be divided into two steps, the examination of the red reflex and examination of the retina and optic nerve. First, set the power on the ophthalmoscope to zero. Now, look at the red reflex of both eyes at the same time from a distance of about one meter. There should be a crisp, clear, symmetric reddish-orange reflex from both eyes. Anything that blocks the visual axis can cause a poor red reflex. This includes cataracts, corneal scars, iritis, or vitreous opacities. In addition, some retinal abnormalities can cause an abnormal red reflex. If the reflex is dim or unequal, there may be a serious eye problem. In children, differences in size, color, or brightness between the red reflexes, when viewed simultaneously, may be indicative of a condition that causes amblyopia. These patients should be referred to an ophthalmologist for evaluation. When evaluating the retina and optic nerve, have the aperture open to the largest size if the patient is dilated. Otherwise, use the smallest circular aperture. If you're examining the patient's right eye, you should hold the direct ophthalmoscope in your right hand and look with your right eye. You should use your left eye when looking at the patient's left eye. If you or the patient or both have refractive errors, you need to adjust the dioptric power of the ophthalmoscope. The ophthalmoscope will have two sets of numbers, usually red and black or green. The black or green numbers signify plus power to correct for farsightedness, hyperopia, and the red numbers represent minus power to correct for nearsightedness, myopia. A simple way to remember this is in financial terms. If you're in debt, you're in the red. Have the patient fixate on a distant target. Position yourself at a 15 degree angle at the side of the patient. Place the thumb of your hand opposite from the ophthalmoscope on the patient's eyebrow to prevent you from bumping into the patient. Look through the ophthalmoscope. If possible, keep both eyes open. Move closer to the patient. If you have difficulty focusing, close your opposite eye. You will only see a small portion of the entire retina through this ophthalmoscope. If you do not initially see a blood vessel, then slowly sweep around the fundus to find one. Find a blood vessel and try to keep that in view. If it's not clear, you can dial in additional plus or minus power to sharpen the image. Follow the blood vessel until it branches. The branching point forms an arrow pointing toward the optic nerve. Follow the vessel all the way back to the optic nerve. When examining the optic nerve, evaluate the color, cup size, and margins. The disc margin should be sharp and clear. The disc should be flat and have a uniform pink-yellow color. There may be a white physiologic depression known as the cup near the center of the optic nerve head. Try to estimate the cup to disc ratio, that is, the diameter of the cup in relation to the diameter of the entire nerve head. Zero indicates no cup. 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 is considered average. Any cup to disc ratio greater than 0.5 should be referred to an ophthalmologist for evaluation of possible glaucoma. Asymmetry greater than 0.2 between the two eyes should also be referred. Signs of pathology include optic nerve head blurring or elevation, pallor, a pale white appearance of the disc, or blood on or around the optic disc. Any question of an abnormality should be referred to an ophthalmologist. After you have finished looking at the disc, examine the vessels from the disc outward to their second bifurcation. The arteries are approximately four-fifths the size of the veins. The arteries also have a slightly redder appearance and may even have an increased light reflex. Signs of pathology include narrowing of the vessels where the arteries cross the veins, as seen here in a hypertensive patient, and neovascularization seen here in a diabetic patient. The last area to examine is the macula. 
It's located approximately two disc diameters temporal and slightly inferior to the optic nerve. The fovea is the central area of the macula and is responsible for sharp central vision. The pigmentation in the fovea is slightly darker than the rest of the retina. If you're unable to find it, you can ask the patient to look directly at the light. The examination of the fovea should be the last part of your fundus exam, as it's slightly uncomfortable for the patient to stare directly into a bright light. Pathology include hemorrhages and exudates, as seen in this diabetic patient, and scarring and atrophy, as seen in this patient with macular degeneration. It is important to know when to refer patients to an ophthalmologist. Vision threatening and treatable causes of vision loss are of course critical reasons to refer. Anterior segment causes for referral include ptosis, proptosis, chronic tearing, inflammation of the eyelids or conjunctiva, especially if persistent or unusual, chemical eye injuries, corneal ulcer, trauma, unequal pupil size, called anisocoria, and sudden onset of eye misalignment in an adult. Posterior segment causes for referral include abnormal appearance of the optic nerve head or retina, intraocular bleeding, and poor visualization of the fundus. Referral is also suggested for symptoms such as sudden loss or obscuration of vision, double vision, and appearance of a curtain or cloud blocking the field of vision. In children, decreased or unequal red reflexes, a white pupil called leukocoria, strabismus, and nystagmus should be referred to the ophthalmologist for evaluation. Systemic conditions that merit an ophthalmology evaluation include diabetes mellitus, HIV infection and AIDS, temporal arteritis, thyroid eye disease, increased intracranial pressure, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and low birth weight premature newborn infants. Other conditions include palsies of cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, which cause strabismus, palsy of cranial nerve 7 as seen in Bell's palsy, and unilateral ptosis as seen in Horner syndrome. Ophthalmology evaluation is also recommended for children with a family history of retinoblastoma, congenital cataracts, or genetic syndromes such as Marfan's. Finally, we will consider special techniques for the pediatric eye exam. Performing an examination on a child can be challenging. Their attention span can be short and they may be shy or fearful in the doctor's office. It is important, however, because amblyopia occurs in 4 to 5 percent of the population. With early diagnosis, preferably well before the child enters school, treatment is more successful. You did a very good job, Anna. And here you go, you get a sticker. As an incentive for children, rewards such as toys, stickers, and lollipops work well. Occluding the eye with tape or an adhesive eye patch is necessary because children will peek around their hand or a handheld occluder. Most children five years or older will be able to read standard Snellen letters or numbers. Many three-year-old children will also be cooperative for the Snellen letters. Always ask the parent and child if they know the alphabet. The tumbling e-chart can also be used with a preliterate child or with an illiterate adult. In a two and a half to three and a half year old child, you can measure visual acuity with a picture chart. You can make this a matching game by giving the child a copy of the pictures that they can point to. Having the parent point to the pictures on the chart can help the child focus on the task of identifying the pictures. When checking the vision in an infant or a child unable to cooperate for formal acuity testing, your goal is to determine if the vision is equal between the two eyes or if there appears to be a visual preference. Small silent toys are effective fixation targets. Observe the patient first with both eyes open, then with one eye at a time occluded to determine whether the patient fixates on a stationary target and then follows a moving target. As the child follows the object, look to see if the fixation is central, that is, does the eye look directly at the target? Does the child hold fixation better with one eye than the other? If there is a strong objection to occlusion of one eye but not the other, this may indicate that the vision is unequal. 
also look for nystagmus in one or both eyes. When examining the pupils in young children, you will want a dimly lit exam room. Begin by looking at the red reflex in both eyes simultaneously using the direct ophthalmoscope as mentioned earlier. Any abnormality or asymmetry of the red reflex should be referred immediately to an ophthalmologist to evaluate for possible cataract, retinoblastoma, or other serious intraocular disease. In infants below one year of age, the possibility of toxicity from the drops is a serious concern. Cyclomidral eye drops have a reduced concentration of medication specifically designed for infants. Proceed with caution when dilating infants. In children over one year of age, one drop of tropicamide 1% or phenylephrine 2.5% in each eye should provide adequate dilation for examination. For young children, it may help to have the parent hold the child. If you have a nurse or technician available to administer the drops, this may make the child less fearful of the physician. To help reduce side effects in infants and small children, press a finger over the medial canthus to occlude the punctum. This helps reduce systemic absorption through the nasolacrimal duct. Thank you for taking time to watch this video on the essentials of the eye exam. With sufficient practice of the techniques covered here, we are confident that you'll be able to perform an excellent basic ocular exam on an adult or child. More detailed information regarding selected topics can be obtained either in video or book format from the American Academy of Ophthalmology.